Hey everyone, this will be a sort of a nice uh, sort of segue from what everyone's built up to over the time there. And I thought I'd include star formation as well as the ISM, because if we're going to talk about things like Starburst, clearly star formations are playing a huge role in what we're doing there. So why do we care about star formation in the ISM in extreme environments? Well, most of the universe is what we call with typical normal. And there we see the ISM and star formation follow simple rules. But as we move to extreme environments, things change. And it's those changes that will give us clues to what's happening in the ISM and star formation and actually get down to the actual physics of that transformation from gas into stars and help us understand what we're going through. Now, huge disclaimer, this is two hours for what is a huge field. There, I have my own biases. I've missed references. Some of you might even know some of these areas better than I do. Um, there's much more out there. I've tried to give you nice references and overviews, but it's a start. So firstly, when I say extreme environments, I'm trying to take Danny stuff and move beyond. So I'm moving to the atypical universe. So things like Eulergs, Starbursts, AGN, highly climatic regions, um, these are sort of the atypical areas that I'll be mentioning. And to give you an overview, I'll touch upon each of these topics here. Eulergs, and when I talk about Eulergs, this gets into the a little bit of a historical perspective just because these things have been studied for a while. Starbursts. The schmidt kennicutt relation, that is outer gas turned into stars. Um, the ISM of these things, AGN outflows, or at least touch upon these, and if I can, hopefully star formation in these highly climatic regions. All right, Eulogs. So ever since we've started looking into the infrared, Eulogs popped out at us. These are hugely bright things. Um, when we look in the infrared universe, apart from the obvious things in the Milky Way, when we look extragalactically, Eulergs are just bright, bright, bright. Um, so when we look at Eulergs, some were already known. They were clearly known to have lots of star formation or even AGN. Um, but in reality, really, Eulergs were some of the first starbursts that we've sort of really got a handle on. Now, ultra-luminous galaxies, and so Danny went through this, is purely a luminosity cut. That is, we say things that have more than 10 to the 12 solar luminosities are Eulergs. Between 10 to the 11, 10 to the 12, Lurgs, and above um, 10 to the 13, Hyperlurgs. In reality, it's just a sort of way to gather you know, interesting things and put them into one basket, but now we know there are a whole broad spectrum of things that can fall into this. Um, now, we actually found this when, you know, Eulergs, really when we went into the near infrared, we could start to see these things were actually much brighter than we saw in the optical. And so even before we launched the first infrared um, satellite, we had an idea that Eulergs were there. But with the launch of IRAS, these things just came into their own. So to give an idea of the history of these things, like I said, some of the first reviews of Eulergs was back in 1996. All right, so we've known these for a while because these things are so bright. And this in a nutshell is their summary of what Eulergs were. These things mostly followed that radio infrared correlation that Danny was talking about. So you can see in terms of the um, straight line up here, all right, these things were very infrared bright. And so as we increased the infrared luminosity, we found a lot more infrared than we did in terms of the carbon monoxide that Julia spoke about. Likewise, if we looked at the atomic gas, we found these things had a lot more molecular gas. So these things were very molecular gas rich. And these things also had very high gas densities. That is, there was a lot of gas, 
in a small area. Yeah. And so that was sort of our understanding in terms of these things in a nutshell. Now, as we looked at Eulergs in the local universe, we found these were all messes, right? And so, you know, as I've been going through, you've been seing some of these, right? My carrying 231, you know, bright stuff, but then fuzzy things around it. Uh, M82, you know, part of an interacting system. Yeah, let's have a look. Up to 20, this complex blob is just, you know, fuzzy stuff around here. These things were clearly merger related. Now, the thing we found is that as we went back in Redshift, we found a lot more, more luminous objects. And again, larger volume, we're seeing the more and more extreme objects. That's what's happening, okay. But the thing is, these things are rare, okay? And so, you know, we don't see anything of this luminosity in the local universe, okay? These things didn't, you know, while hugely bright, didn't make up much of the total infrared luminosity out there. Likewise, in terms of, you know, uh, if we looked at the galaxy luminosity distribution, these things were a tiny fraction, okay? But these things are bright. And so that's why we're able to see these things all the way out to high redshifts back in the early days. And so as we look back, we get a better understanding of why we're seeing this. And so there are high redshift uh, descriptions now of these infrared luminosity objects. And in fact, you know, another term for these, especially in high redshift, is submillimeter galaxies. So like I was saying, most Eulergs in the local universe are uh, interactions, right? So we look at different wavelengths, we can see all these strange shapes, sometimes two hosts, sometimes just one complex mess. Um, but when we went to the infrared, all we would see is one huge bright clump of where all the star formation is occurring. And that's one of the issues when talking about Eulergs is, yeah, as we look in different wavelengths, we're seeing different parts of it, right? As we get to the rest frame UV, we see sort of the outflow, the sudden, sorry, not outflow, some of the outer parts of star formation, um, maybe parts of the galaxies that have been stripped off. But as we went to the infrared, we would see that real huge interaction. The other problem with Eulergs is these things are hugely infrared bright. And that generally means large amounts of dust and large amounts of dust mean large amounts of extinction. So identifying what's causing this huge amount of infrared luminosity was originally quite hard. Yeah. So like I'm saying, you know, we can get into this, into the near infrared, because we start to peer through the dust. And we start when we look at these, we find most star formation is causing most of that luminosity, all right? But as we increase luminosity, we definitely see a large fraction of uh, AGN. And again, as you go more and more luminous, you find more and more of these um, Eulergs actually have AGN as well. Now, the contribution of the AGN to the overall heating still somewhat debated, but generally it's felt that most of the luminosity is coming from star formation, but some fraction and some significant, uh, some galaxies, some Eulogs have significant fractions of AGN heating, getting up to sort of the quasar type objects. And, and again, IDing these things is hard, right? Even as we went to Spitzer, um, mid-infrared spectroscopy, we can start to identify these things, but you know, some of the Eulergs are known to have optical depths greater than 60, okay? And so um, this means infrared starts to be opaque, okay? And so that means that even mid-infrared traces, it's extremely difficult to identify these objects. Now, there are some very good surveys out there talking about 
a lot of the nearby objects. So Goals has been doing this for you know, 10, 15 years um, in terms of surveying a lot of the local luminous infrared galaxies, identifying them, describing their general hosts as a function of luminosity. And now you know, we're bringing in Muse and Alma to a lot of these and you know, really helping us discover what's going on at the center of these objects. Um, yeah, right. So star formation, as I said, does most of this, but you know, again, it's hard to imagine just how much is coming into the infrared, right? I mean, you look at R220, 99% of its luminosity is coming out in the infrared. Uh, I mean, this is a luminosity rate of thing. So you can see that just at one single wavelength, you've got, you know, one and a half magnitudes difference there, right? Most of the typical universe, galaxies like the Milky Way, 50, 50, 40, 60, things like this. But for these objects, infrared is all. Right, so like I've been saying, Eulerx, it's all about huge amounts of gas and huge amounts of gas densities. And most of that is molecular. Mergers uh, and interactions are somehow driving all this gas into a central area. And because you're driving gas all the way into the centers of galaxies, quite often this leads to AGN um, and even black hole mergers at some point. You know, the, the high gas and dust columns process most of the light into the infrared. Okay. Now, one key point and why I like to move away from just the Eulerg definition is that at high redshift, what we find is that many galaxies become Eulergs. Now, this is not because we've got huge amounts of mergers and things like that at high redshift. It's because we know that as we evolve in redshift, most galaxies increase in their star formation rate. Okay, now, yet yeah, clearly there must be more gas accretion, things like that, but we're not talking huge, big galaxy, galaxy, one to one, one to 10 type mergers. Okay, and so Eulergs as itself, simple luminosity of things break down as you go to that. It's not to say at high redshift, there are not galaxy galaxy mergers with huge amounts of star base, but we need to move up in luminosity to catch these objects. So yeah, like I said, why we look at Eulergs? Well, these things are extreme monsters. Okay, and that just means we can see them and we've seen them for a long time. Okay, because they're extreme monsters, they've got high gas densities, um, AGN, warm molecular hydrogen, they're compact, so high surface brightnesses. All of these things mean they're easy to observe. They have interesting features, um, high optical depths, interesting objects. Um, and one thing to realize is also when you look at the infrared, and if I go back to this, if we look all the way down here at the infrared, as we go back in redshift, you're moving up this slope, right? This is what's called negative K correction. And what it means is that at high redshift, you can be very luminous just because you're moving up this spectral slope. So. That's why these things were a favor a while ago, because we can just keep observing these things back and back and back. Now, okay. but why not Eulergs? Well, again, I've sort of talked about this. These things are extreme monsters. They're rare, all right? Limited number. They are not representative of the galaxy population. Likewise, they are not the dominant contribution of star formation in the local universe. As much as they're huge in terms of star formation rates, things like that, they are not contributing much overall to that. The huge optical depths make um, diagnosing what's going on in these things hard. And then there's other contributions to these things. These things are messes. You've got shocks, outflows, AGN, all occurring in the same object. And finally, how are we meant to study these objects when it's just hard to see? Mm 
All right. So for the next parts, I'll separate these things out. I'll talk about Starbursts. I'll talk about AGNs. But when we talk about these kind of things in the local universe, quite often with, I'm talking about ULOGs. All right, so let's move on to Starburst as a specific thing. All right, in the local universe, you know, when we talk about Starbursts, we're talking about generally specific objects, right? The things I've been showing, M82, NGC 253. Again, we're talking about rare things. Um, Likewise, where in the local universe, we tend to talk about starburst regions, right? Regions within galaxies where star formation is excessive, all right? To get to global starbursts, I need to, again, move a little bit further away for these objects. Sorry, that's a little bit of feedback. Um, all right, so I've been talking about excessive star formation, but to talk about excessive, I need to know what's typical. All right. And Danny spoke a little bit about this, but in the nearby universe, we've been talking uh, most galaxies, or at least most star forming galaxies, appear to follow a very tight relation between star formation and their stellar mass. All right. And for some reason, like we always do, we just called it the main sequence. Okay. Let alone that main sequence already existed back then in terms of stars. So, this is the star forming galaxy main sequence. Sloan really gave it to us just because in terms of the huge number of galaxies. And it's amazingly tight given the huge number of galaxies. All right, quite a few fall below, especially at high solar masses. Um, and so these are the ellipticals, of course, that Danny was talking about. All right, and we talk about them in terms of being passive, quenched, things like this. Uh, but some fraction have a higher star formation. We call these starbursts, but what's that fraction? And, and you can start to see some of the issues in talking about starbursts when we get to the highest um, solar masses as well. Uh, so some of the first work was more at high redshift in trying to work out what's going on, All right? So you can see here's that main sequence we're talking about. And yet when we look at this, we see a slight tail, um, which they called starburst. In this case, they tried to fit them with, you know, two log normal populations, but in generally, you know, you've got this tiny fraction, a few percent relative to most galaxies that are forming stars. And when you compare the two, we find these things are gas rich with ext increased extinction, especially at the high um, solar masses. When we look at in much larger galaxy populations, we can start to see it becomes a little bit hard. So as we vary stellar mass, right, we try and fit a log normal to the star formation rate and mass, and you can see a tail off to the, um, off to low star formation rates. These are your green valley off to passive galaxies. And then at some fraction, you've got the star bursts. But exactly where to draw this line is still not exactly clear. And like I've been suggesting, there is it's kind of hard to trace the exact main sequence once you expand the region of galaxies, right? So the main sequence here, fairly obvious. Okay, as you get to the high um, stellar mass galaxies, there's a bend and it's still not clear whether this is where the main sequence be or does the main sequence turn over. Okay, so there's still an argument exactly where that is. And of course you can see once you do that, then your few sigma changes quite significantly. Likewise at the low mass end, you know, there's a lot more scatter. This goes to what Danny was talking about in terms of at low mass end, you end up a lot more stochastic. Um, but again, there's always this population up here, excessive that you might call starburst. And then finally, like I said, evolution's important too. 
All right. A lot of work has been done in terms of what's the evolution of a typical galaxy as we go back in redshift. And so if you don't take account of that, then what you would call as a starburst will change. So now again, we try to map what the evolution of the main sequence is across redshift and starbursts will always be this object that lies above. And this goes to what I was saying, right? This isn't the evolution of typical main sequence galaxies um, and you know, massive main sequence galaxies. And you can see they become much more molecular gas rich. So much so that when you compare them to local starbursts, you'd call them the same kind of thing. Okay, so what you need to do is evolve starbursts as well. And that's what we try and do is say starbursts are always the most excessive objects. Finally, about their properties. It's only really now, once we have these huge galaxy surveys, both with high redshift, right? And this was a nice, the previous slide was a nice review by uh, Linda Taconi et al. in terms of mapping these things. Um, and now with uh, X, a coal gas, X coal gas, we really have a statistical handle on what gas properties are like across galaxies. And it's thanks to that, that we can then start to map what are starbursts, okay? And again, you start to see this thing of, we talk about gas richness for these objects, but if we look at just purely H1 in the left plot, we see that gas richness changes as a function of stellar mass. Things that are small have huge amounts of H1 relative to their stellar mass. Things that are massive, you start to see a lot less H1 relative to their stellar mass. However, molecular gas, it's a varying picture. We see a much more variation in terms of star formation than we do in terms of stellar mass. So I can go here, I increase in, stellar, in uh, molecular gas relative to my stellar mass. And here, increased molecular gas relative to my stellar mass. And then finally, this gets to something that Danny touched upon, that depletion time, All right? And this is what I'll start to get talk about is that there's a huge range in depletion time because of this. So starbursts are interesting. Passive galaxies down here and Green Valley are interesting as well in terms of suppression but I'm not going to talk about that side. Right? I'm going to talk about this side. Now I've talked about resolve starbursts and it's that same idea. Now with these huge IFU surveys, Manga, Sami, Khalifa, we really have put a main sequence of star formation relative to stellar mass on a surface density scale. Okay, and so again, most galaxies tend to follow a trend, all right, with large dispersion between this. However, as we look in more and more detail, we seem to find that a lot of this is actually due to the relation of gas and star formation. So you can see here's that trend of star formation, sorry, star formation in color versus stellar mass, it goes increased, but you can also see that gas increases the same. And if we look at gas versus star formation rate, there's a much more closer trail. As we get closer and closer, we can even break this up, not just on galaxies, but even in terms of galaxy environments, looking at uh, disks, spiral arms, bars, centers, they all follow this trend, but we start to see breaking up of uh, the star formation rate versus stellar mass, and likewise, the, the molecular gas versus stellar mass. And again, they seem to follow that same trend where they go this, but huge scatter. Physics is going on at these scales. So going forward, I'm going to be mixing resolve star bursts versus global star bursts. And in general, same thing, right? As you're up this end, these things have huge amounts of star formation rate in a small area. 
but as you get to sort of the nearby objects, there are things which have localized starbursts, but have similar star formation rates to other objects. Okay, so global starburst generally resolved starburst. That is huge amounts of star formation in small space, but resolved and not always global starbursts. And again, nearby galaxies, we're really talking about the same number, same objects again and again. Um, now, the resolved starbursts, what we tend to talk about, tend to be circumnuclear. Not always, but most of the time, the star formation that's occurring in a small amount of area tends to be localized towards the center. Likewise, there's a strong correlation with bars, not always. Uh, interactions as well can help with this. Okay, and so yeah, clear examples of M82, 253, uh, 1097 like here. Okay, and we zoom into this, we can clearly see huge amounts of star formation in a small amount of space. All right, in a nice ring pattern. And again, this is near infrared imaging and you can still see dust patterns against the stars. Even in resolved starbursts, extinctions playing havoc with our view of what's going on. Likewise, we tend to see correlations with AGN but it's not always one-to-one. -one. Okay, so things like 1365, 1068, 1097 are all have starbursting rings. They also have AGN at their center, um, but I can think of examples that don't always correlate. So I've been talking a lot about gas and star formation in reality, we put a name on this, which is the Schmidt Kennicutt or Kennicutt Schmidt, or if you're Rob Kennicutt, just the Schmidt relation. Okay. And it's all about how do we turn gas into stars? So you've heard this talked about star formation efficiency. Melanie's talked about, you've heard this talked about depletion times. It's really the same thing, all just measured in different ways and different scales. And so this first put forward by the amazing polymath, Schmidt, who also came up with first ideas for the IMF um, and found that, you know, if we put this together, stars and gas follow each other, all right? Now, with, now we think this is obvious, but back then, this is really coming up with the idea of what that process is. Um, Rob took it further and really put a whole lot onto the same scale. Um, and found you know, a remarkably tight relation between the amount of star formation that we saw and the amount of molecular gas that, or total gas that we saw. Um, now, going forward, the things to remember is depletion time is simply given the amount of star formation rate we have, how long before we deplete all the gas that we see. So that's what we will talk about in terms of depletion time. Star formation efficiency the key there is that a time step is involved. And so you will hear various forms of that star formation efficiency. Now on GMC scales, it's the same sort of idea because really you've got only got one cloud. So it's a matter of what fraction of that cloud will turn into stars. But as you get globally, that doesn't really make sense. And so people use time scales, three, four time scales, constant star formation histories, always check what people are talking about when they talk about star formation efficiency in terms of the time scales being used. Now, it's thanks to large galaxy surveys again, things, Heracles, that we're really able to push this down to proper kiloparsec scales. Now, not just averaging globally over a galaxy, but really measuring at kiloparsec scales across different parts of galaxies and you know, finding, again, this remarkable tight relation between gas and star formation. And this is you know, not as huge as the radio far infrared correlation in terms of orders of magnitude, but lots of regions all there. And now, with nearby galaxy service like FANGS, we've just got 
a lot more regions to look at, okay? Across 100 galaxies, uh, again, we're finding that small scatter across two orders of magnitude, um, many different types of galaxies in terms of star formation. Now, going forward, you can start to see a column here, right? And this is about how do you measure star formation and how do you measure the gas down the bottom? And this comes to keys and understanding what is that star formation process? What gas is turning to stars? How do we see stars? How do we measure the amount of stars being formed? And as we go from galactic to extra galactic, that definition changes. And that's always something to remember when you're talking to people in various areas. What do they mean when they're talking about star formation? What do they mean when they're talking about gas? So that gets to this point. So we put all that together, right? And this is what Frank did with his 2008 paper. We get a huge amount of galaxies with the H1, H2, and even putting in the star bursts. And suddenly that wonderfully tight relation now appears a mess. Uh, and there are, again, physics going on here. And this is what we're trying to do is understand what breaks this up. Why does it look like this? Right? So that tight relation really has scatter, has various points. What's causing this? So some ideas. Oh, don't do that. <sighs> Sorry. So that's exactly what I'm getting to. All right. So everything down this end, H1 dominated. This end, normal galaxies. Again, that's sort of there's a lot of molecular gas, star formation. And up this end, starburst galaxies. All right. And there are reasons why we might expect these differences for this. And it goes to, um, no, I should say that even on, you know, extremely resolved scales for starbursts, right? So here, these data points are from that Kennecut 98 paper, okay? And so these are actually just integrated and averaged over areas. These are not at the same kiloparsec scales as all of this data. You know, but even when we resolve these Eulergs and high star formation rates and high molecular gas densities, we see that same sort of trend where there's an excess of star formation for the amount of molecular gas we're measuring. You know, and the Kennecut and Dossolaris really put this all together, right? So this is now including a huge amount of local objects, resolved, getting proper measures for star formation and gas. And you see four starburst galaxies, you see an excess of star formation for the amount of gas we have. And going on to that high redshift example, we do see high redshift, huge things. These are the kind of things Danny's mentioned as well. Galaxies with thousands of solar masses per year globally, even things with 100, 300 solar masses per year of star formation formed in a tiny little area. But we also see galaxies with huge amounts of gas measured that have that same sort of relation that we see in local spirals. So there seems to be scatter here at high redshift. And this might be linked to the fact that these things are starbursts at high redshift, and these things are typical galaxies at high redshift. So they still have lots of gas, but their star formation rate doesn't seem as excessive. And so it all comes down to what we're measuring with these things. Okay. Where how we measure star formation rate and how we measure gas come to play a huge role in what we're talking about here. Okay, and it goes back to what I had here in terms of defining sort of separate regions for these. This 
is the H1 dominated universe. Okay, we see a clear decline of um, star formation relative to the amount of gas we have. And that suggests either our efficiency has dropped, somehow star gas is less able to form stars than that, or maybe that gas, all of that gas is not going into the process of forming stars. Right? And that's sort of a lot of our idea is that here, we're seeing a lot more H1, not all of that H1 is going into that star formation rate process. Here, this is sort of that nice tight relation. We see quite good scatter here. We're measuring mostly molecular gas and most molecular gas we're measuring is turning into stars. And here, what we're measuring, you know, suggests, so either again, that molecular gas we're measuring is turning into stars much more rapidly, much more, yeah, so depletion times are much shorter or that gas is turning into stars much more efficiency, efficiently, or there's an issue in the way we're measuring the molecular gas. All right, and that's sort of summarizing what we have is that kennicutt schmidt relation, you know, nowadays doesn't seem outrageous, right? You've got more gas, you'll get more stars. Um, now we see a similar efficiency across normal galaxy disks, right? And this is at kiloparsec scales. The scatter there is actually not large at all. Starbursts, however, are offset. Likewise, H1 dominated galaxies offset. Um, the star formation rates we measure, I mentioned this, in ULERGs, we're pretty confident. Okay. Yes, AGN might be playing a role, but we can start to separate these out. And like I said, the way we've been measuring ULERG suggests that AGN are not contributing hugely to the infrared luminosities we have. And so ULERGs are actually amazing bolimeters, which means you just take all the star formation, absorb it all, and re-emit re it as infrared luminosity. Therefore, infrared luminosity equals star formation rate. And in fact, that's what we've been doing since IRAS. Okay. Now there are IMF concerns. Okay. If the stellar IMF is different in these extreme environments than what we see in typical disk galaxies, then that star formation rate can be off, right? Because there's always that assumption that we're measuring these high mass stars when we're talking about star formation rates. But if those high mass stars are not representative of those low mass stars where most of the mass is, then our star formation rates will be off. Now, we can't be too bad because, you know, if we were hugely off, we would see different amounts of stars in the local universe. But that is an open question of what's going on at the depth of these ULURGs. Is the IMF different? But like I said, I think most of the issues, and I think most people tend to agree, lie in terms of how we're measuring the gas. All right. So clearly, ULOGs are different and these extreme starbursts. So something is going wrong about these. Likewise, most of those ULOGs measures are not resolved. Maybe there's an issue of we're not measuring the proper sizes for these things. And so again, I point to the Kennecutt and Delorsere's paper as a very good discussion on a lot of these issues and they've tried to deal with all of them. And so I'll be using a lot of their plots for this. And so a clear point is how we convert a tracer we can measure, carbon monoxide, to the molecular gas mass, all right? Julia spoke about this uh, in her presentations, but really starbursts are extreme, not like the Milky Way. So why would we expect that same conversion to work? Uh, um, and that's sort of what we do. And so we have a good understanding in terms of, we measure the dynamics of some of these things. And it's clear that if we use the Milky Way measure, we end up with you know, the wrong kind of amount of molecular gas. So that conversion between carbon monoxide and uh, molecular hydrogen is not the same in ULURGs and must be lower. That much we understand. The only problem is, that makes our problem a little bit worse, okay? So again, if 
carbon monoxide measures less gas, then suddenly we end up with a lot more star formation than we have for this. So a lot of work has gone on to this in terms of um, why would we expect this correlation between carbon monoxide and molecular gas to be different. And the uh, a huge discussion in the review of Alberto Bellato et al. Um, and some good theory work by Deska Narayan, um, Mark Krumpholtz for this, which try and say what's going on. But no matter what we do, we still end up with a lot more star formation than we expect with molecular gas. Right. In terms of alpha CO, uh, Karen and her students have also tried to do this in nearby galaxies. And again, we're starting to see that there is no reason why we might expect this conversion factor to be constant across all environments. Even in you know, typical galaxies, we're starting to see variations here. Now, there's always maybe we're measuring the uh, gas mass wrong, but all that we have point to the fact that this conversion between carbon monoxide and gas needs to take account of these various measures. Uh, Karen will talk about the low metallicity side, but clearly dynamics, gas densities all play a role in what we're doing in trying to convert carbon monoxide into molecular gas. Um, but like I said, even if we try and vary um, the carbon monoxide, so if we use just a Milky Way value, we end up with this steep relation where star formation here is much more for the same amount of molecular gas than what we see in local galaxies, all right? So that's that slope here, it's about 1.5. If we use a different conversion factor that tries to take account of all of these effects, uh, what we see is an even steeper relation. So but no matter what we do for the amount of gas we see, and generally when I'm talking about gas here, it's molecular gas, we're measuring a lot more stars. All right. Even if we use sort of, you know, offsets, constant values, there's clearly some weird distinction between the starburst environment and typical galaxies. All right. And still, you know, is this a continuous? Is this a jump? There's a, still some arguments. Most tend to agree that it's a it's a continuous relation rather than a jump, but um, still going for this. Even resolution is not resolving the problem. Okay, we see as we get down to resolving the starburst regions, knowing exactly the area of which they're emitting, comparing with local galaxies, we still see this systematic effect where things with excessive star formation have more stars than we expect from the molecular gas we're measuring. And this sort of summarizes it. If we just use a Standard ratio compared and include all gas, we see this relation. If we only look at molecular gas, we see this relation where starbursts always have more uh, a lower depletion time. That is, they more rapidly consume the molecular gas than typical galaxies. Okay. And in fact, our idea for what's causing this sort of offset when we go from full gas to molecular gas is simply the H1. So the H, most of the H1 we see is not going directly into that star formation rate process. It doesn't mean that that H1 won't eventually form stars, but when we're doing this total measure now, the key player, at least in typical galaxies we see here, is the molecular gas. even when we're using an independent measure, right? In this case, dust, we still see a systematic relation between local galaxies, sorry, typical galaxies and starbursts, right? where they, there is that excess of star formation relative to the amount of dust we measure. So all of this points that star formation is more efficient in your lives. Why, right? This is a big question. Um, now, there are clues, some of which Melanie talked about yesterday. Um, maybe it's in the feedback processes. Maybe there are other things. But 
it's clear that there is a slightly different process going on in terms of star formation. Now, as we get nearby, we're moving sort of away from that clear starburst relation, but we still see systematic differences between different environments. Okay, and that will help us try and understand understand and disentangle what's going on. Okay, when we compare the stellar mass uh, and star formation, we see, you know, that um, relation, what we would call the resolved main sequence, actually starts to separate with disks here. Um, well, sorry, spiral arms clearly having excess star formation for the amount of stellar mass that are there. Likewise, bars, huge amount of stellar mass, not as much star formation. Uh, but when we look at molecular gas, so now this is getting towards that Kennecutt-Schmidt relation, we can see that those star bursting rings tend to have excessive star formation, whereas bars tend to actually have reduced star formation for the amount of molecular gas that's going on there. And so there are clues going on for what's going on here. And, you know, there's a huge range in galaxies, okay? So that's always the thing to remember is I'm talking about, you know, the, what's the standard. But um, Miguel Carajeta tried to do this for the full uh, FANG sample. And you can see that for um, the star formation rate in galaxy centers is increased, right? So we sort of known this for a while that but there's a lot more star formation towards the centers of galaxies than on the outskirts. That also goes with the molecular gas mass. There's, as you go from the outskirts of galaxies to the centers of galaxies, there's a lot more molecular gas. But spirals, slightly more than the interarm and disks. We sort of know that already. We can see spiral arms in terms of molecular gas. Um, star formation rate, again, excessive, just because it's in a smaller area. Um, but the thing to notice is that bars also seem to be offset. And again, maybe there are clues there for what's going on in terms of this um, relation between star formation and molecular gas. So that's the Kennecutt Schmidt, our best understanding of what's going on. Let's stretch, take that all in, and have a chance to ask questions. Just to clarify, at the beginning, you show the star formation main sequence bent, but uh, uh, when you saw show can you get to meet the law, the ULAX are up. Yes. So can you so, clarify this difference? So that the main sequence is more about, you know, like where a typical star formation rate for a galaxy lies. Um, and at low masses, it seems to follow all the way up to about 10 to the 10, 10 to the 10.5, and then there seems to be a bent. Okay, now why this is, still debate, this does go with the shape of the galaxy mass function. There are clues there in terms of maybe galaxies above this mass are much more likely to be quenched. Does that mean, you know, I should consider starburst to be above? So our ideas for why the turnover likely to do with environment, quenching, things like this. So moving away from that starburst question to, you know, what causes quenching of massive galaxies uh, for that. And so that's a separate talk altogether. Um, but in terms of measuring starbursts, it's still not clear to me, should we be comparing with what's typical at those masses, or should we be comparing what we expect in terms of just following a main sequence all above there? So I don't know. Um, so thanks for the nice talk. And I have a couple of questions. Um, one is, um, at the beginning, I think you mentioned that uh, when you talk about Eulergs, they are uh, the most luminous sources in the universe among the non-transient ones, right? Um, but And so I'm wondering, how long does the starburst last? That's a good question, right? So... Um... To estimate this, 
here, you can try and use the cosmological models. How many times do you expect galaxy mergers to be? All right, and then compare with the amount of eulergs we see and try and work out the time scale for that. Clearly, they you know, can't last more than the depletion time unless gas feeding is going on at the same time, right? So that depletion time must give some clue for what the time scale of a eulerg is. But we're talking, you know, at most sort of 10, 100, no, 10, 100 million years, because these are sort of the depletion times we're measuring for these objects. Um, and unless they keep getting fed, it's unlikely they'll be lasting much longer than this. But, you know, I don't have an answer in terms of what's the expected there, but, you know, clearly they can't mm -hmm. last long because you've got lots of star formation, not much gas. And combined with that, if you've got all that star formation in the same spot, you're likely to get outflows as well. All right. And um, if I can ask a second question, um, you also mentioned that um, typically the starbursting region is a circumnuclear uh, ring, right? In nearby galaxies, right? Yeah. So the, Look, yes. Okay. And uh, do we have information on the kinematics of this ring? I mean, is it some, is it expanding? Is it, uh, w w what is happening? Well, I mean, it's not expanding. It's, I mean, for, for the ones I know of, it, you know, the one for this nearby galaxies, it's clearly associated with the bars. For M82, it's hard to tell edge on, but it's likely due to interaction um, because it's part of the interacting system. Um, so what we see are the kinematics rotating. Okay, so it's part of the galaxy disk, but somehow there's a lot more gas in that area than we expect. The lifetime of these, again, I don't know. People have estimated for this. It's likely due to something, you know, combination of gas, bars, I don't know for that answer for the lifetime for certain nuclear rings. Yeah. Um, I have a set of questions, but I think I'll discuss a few later. The, the one last question is like, if we'll go a slide back when we're talking about the offsets in, in normal galaxies. Yep. Yeah, so we do uh, like yesterday, Melanie, uh, if I'm not wrong, so Melanie was talking about it and there are three plots here. The first one is showing the high molecular density in the center, which makes sense. And then the star formation rate is super high in center. That is That also makes sense because molecular gas is much more higher in center than any other in bar or spiral. But when we were talking yesterday, we were talking about there is so much of kinematics and there's so much uh, like uh, feedback and everything is going on in the center that the star formation is relatively lower in the center then the arms are, uh, I, can, I guess, spiral arms. So I, I really um, have a confusion in here. Should make it clear? So uh, we've talked about the, the um, central molecular zone for the Milky Way. And again, we do start to see that depression for that. But you know, when I talk about galaxy centers here, this is across a huge range of galaxies. Right? And some, you know, they're not all starbursts. Quite often, they're just typical galaxies without it. And so there's a lot of molecular gas there. Some of these are starbursts, and that's probably why they average down in terms of depletion time. Right? And so big spread. Some of these are starbursts. In fact, you know, there's some fraction of the FANG sample, I don't know if the top of my head, do have circumnuclear rings. Uh, I definitely know that we have a large number of bars in FANGs. And so it's probably related. Um, so that might explain what we're seeing here, but you know, I can't answer you exactly what's going on there, but definitely we do know something about the central molecular zone and I'll get to that hopefully at the end of the talk. You don't want to you have a question? Okay, thank you. <laughs> hey, thank, thank you very much. Um, okay. Um, you said that uh, lyrics are very rare in the, lo in the local universe. But okay, we know they kind of control the star formation rate at Rashi 2. Like, kind of, like. Hang on. So, I mean, so Eulergs, yes. as in luminous infrared galaxies or ultra luminous infrared galaxies, at Redshift 2, we see a lot more galaxies would fall into that class. Okay. okay. And that's just simply because we know that the main sequence of galaxies evolves with Redshift. Or to put it another way, at redshift two, 
galaxies of Milky Way mass form a lot more stars. Okay. But do you think that somehow these uh, lyrics are like progenitors of the lyrics we see today locally? No. So, I mean, again, this is the issue, what we call progenitor bias. So okay. the things we see there are unlikely to be the Eulogs now. They're likely to be maybe closer to the elliptic galaxies. Okay. So galaxies are going to grow over time. And so we have to sort of work out what would be the progenitor of the Milky Way or what would be the progenitors of ARP220, for example. Okay, thank you. All right, I feel like maybe you should continue and we'll have yep. more have questions at the end. So clearly there's something about the ISM and that star formation process in your lurks that are causing this um, change between local galaxies and star bursts. All right. And it's, the clues lie in what we see. We see a lot of molecular gas. We also see that molecular gas being high density. So that's a lot of molecular gas in the same or smaller areas. And this molecular gas tends to be warm. You've got lots of star formation, AGN in there. It's clearly going to heat it up. Likewise, mergers kinetically going to heat it up. So warm, dense, and a lot of it is the key points to take away from Eulergs in terms of their gas. Um, the other fun point is their high luminosity, high surface brightness, lots of molecules. They show a suite of molecular lines, you know, many of them which we can only observe in the Milky Way. Right? Because these things are so bright, we can get you know, lines that we just can't see anywhere else even. Uh, and the you know, things I point to is uh, some of the um, spire um, pack spectra of Eulergs where we just have carbon monoxide going up and up and up and up. And we get lines that you just rarely see elsewhere. I mean, you see high excitation CO, like I've talked about, but you see molecular, you see water, you see... Um, I forget the names of the molecules, but HCO plus, HCN, so hydrogen cyanide, very high levels across the whole things. And so that gives us clues to what's going on in the molecular gas. Right. Now, Julia spoke about yesterday about the uh, carbon monoxide molecule, how we can use those rotational transitions to sort of what we understand. When we look at ULURGS, we can trace that letter, not only that one to zero and two to one transition, we get up to 30 to 29 and you know, 20 to 19. These are huge excitations. We just don't see these in many other environments. Okay, so if I put in sort of the Milky Way down the bottom here, it turns over at sort of five to four. These things, uh, let me zoom in. These things, you know, there's the Milky Way going yeah, maximum three to two, uh, turnover five to four. Whereas Eulergs and these uh, AGN, we're measuring up to huge values. And so that just clearly says the gas here is hot. It's being excited up to levels we just don't see elsewhere. Yeah. And the thing is, you know, some of these are known AGN. So NGC 1068, NGC 6040, but M82 is there and that's not an AGN and it still goes up and over. ARP220 also goes up and over, but that's because other issues. ARP220 is one of those objects with AV greater than 60. And so what we're seeing there, it's likely that the high rotational transitions they themselves are being obscured. That is, all the way into the mid and far infrared, we're seeing obscuration thanks to ARP220. And so when people talk about ARP220, use it as an example of a mess, right? Yeah, the, the, obscur the obscuration there makes it very hard to see what's going right at the center. Um, and so we can use these rotational measures of carbon monoxide and compare it to, you know, dense versus, um, uh, not so dense molecular gas. And we can clearly see this thing lies in a weird region. So all of this suggests that this 
alpha CO that we've been talking about is difficult in your lurks because of these conditions. And so, like I said before, um, Desik and Narayan, Mark Kromholtz did a good work in trying to look at what might be happening in starburst galaxies. So using sort of the PDR models we heard about last week and a bit more physical modeling in terms of the environments, they tried to work out as you, you know, go to a galaxy merger, increased your star formation rate, what will happen to the clouds? What will happen to the emission from carbon monoxide? And so what they found is that clearly gas densities increase in starbursts. We knew this, the um, molecular and clouds themselves are much more turbulent. They're much warmer. The kind of things that we sort of were seeing from all those lines. And so it pushes you into a different regime. And from that, they were able to model the carbon monoxide um, ladder and try and work out what happens as you increase the star formation rate surface density for this, try and do a conversion of infrared luminosity or star formation rate surface density to alpha CO that people could use. So changing gear, you've heard a lot about how the gas in Eulergs and Starburst has to be much denser. You've got a lot more carbon monoxide or um, molecular gas in a small area. And so this then led sort of, you know, the nice work of Gow and Solomon to look at other traces in Eulergs. Like I say, they're bright, we can measure other lines and these other lines give us clues for what's going on. So not many people here have yet spoken about these traces, but as you measure different mo molecules, you're measuring different parts of the gas. Okay, we talked about how you know, measuring oxygen three versus H alpha gets you different parts. Measuring H alpha versus carbon monoxide gets you different parts of the gas. The same is true as we go to the molecular transitions. Carbon monoxide measures a certain range in gas density, but as we measure things like hydrogen cyanide, we're actually moving to slightly denser gas. And so taking this, uh, Eulogs are bright, so we're able to see the slightly weaker transition of hydrogen cyanide, and use it as a tracer for the dense gas fraction. Um, and what they found is as you increase the infrared luminosity, you had a standard value and then it increased. So clearly we're seeing a lot more dense clumps in Eulergs than we are seeing in typical galaxies. All right, so while as we had the infrared to carbon monoxide increases as a function of infrared luminosity, this is sort of a proxy for that Kennecutt-Schmidt relation um, or saying that your depletion time or star formation efficiency changes as we move from typical galaxies to Eulergs. As we go to the top axis, we can see the infrared luminosity to hydrogen cyanide and that looks quite flat. Okay, so as we move to dense gas traces, we actually see something that looks like a constant. So maybe what's changing is not that the molecular gas is more efficient, it's more efficient at getting more dense, okay? And that might be what's happening in your lurks. Now we've looked at other traces and we see similar things, although other traces can also be inter in impacted by things that we do know occur in your lurks, like shocks and AGN. Um, but we see that typical tracer of that the infrared luminosity versus the far infrared luminosity, or even the infrared luminosity versus the dense gas um, luminosity does seem to be quite constant, maybe with some scatter. Even when we start to resolve these things in nearby galaxies, you know, the ALMA has really helped us in terms of tracing these things, and we're getting a much better idea now what's going on. Um, so this is work by Adam Leroy looking at NGC 253. So this is this nearby galaxy with huge starburst in the center. Um, and so we're able to look at that starburst in the center and see, yes, it lies in that starburst regime when we compare you know, carbon monoxide to star formation. But when we look at, in the bottom plot, the HCN, the infrared, it also lies on that straight line between Milky Way, local galaxies, and starbursts on the right. So 
we are seeing that the dense gas is a much better trace of the star formation, especially when we want to compare local galaxies or typical galaxies with starbursts. Um, again, Alma, Fangs has really helped us push this. And so there's the expanded um, Platzberg, uh, other traces to get all the molecular gas traces. So Empire, Almond, Fangs combined cell sample has really allowed us to get this at a resolved measure in nearby galaxies. And again, that means some of those points are star starburst-like. Okay, and so you can see that correlation is much tighter and one-to-one -one when we compare the infrared luminosity with the uh, luminosity of HCN or hydrogen cyanide. Um, and, you know, there's that one-to-one -one line. Now there's scatter, clearly, but that scatter is, you know, quite small. We're talking 0.5 dex or so, and maybe it's related uh, to cloud properties. And so this is something that Justin Newman um, and others looked into. And when they looked across the uh, Fangs almond sample, they did find slight correlations of the star formation rate versus HCN with cloud properties, such as the gas surface density, the dispersion, um, and even the virial perimeter. All right. So there are clues going on for what's happening that we can push towards the starburst type side. And again, even looking at a single galaxy and breaking up into regions, we see that same sort of variation of star formation to HCN as we go from outer parts to inner parts of galaxies. And so there are clues going on here um, for how gas becomes atomic, molecular, very dense to that star formation rate process that we can get from both nearby galaxies and starbursts. Like I said, there's also a suite of other molecular lines there. And you know, I really don't have time to get into all of these, but they can give us other diagnostic processes for what's going on in terms of heating, temperature, the different environments for this. Um, and so, you know, by using those suites, we get to get a good feel for what's going on in terms of molecular gas and heating in ULURGS. So thing to take away from the ISM of ULURGS and Starburst is that they have high gas, um, gas masses, high gas mass surface densities. Clear evidence that the gas in these objects is much more dense. And I should say, when I say dense, I'm now talking about the volume density rather than the surface density. Um, likewise, the, this gas is warmer. So that means both kinematically, um, we see clouds that are disturbed or you measure the temperatures, dust, uh, CO, we see clearly this gas is warm on average. There are the extra, extra heating sources in a lot of yellows. So X-rays from the AGN, shocks from the stellar winds, outflows or from the accretion. Um, a lot of star formation likely mean, and AGN likely mean cosmic rays are playing a larger role of what's going on in heating the molecular clouds. And again, this goes to what we heard earlier and what we heard last week in that as you get denser and denser, deeper into the molecular clouds, cosmic rays play a larger role of what's going on. And so again, that's probably playing something in terms of what we're seeing in the molecular lines. So yeah, the joys of ALMA is that we're now reaching scales that we just haven't been able to do outside the Milky Way Magellanic clouds. Okay, we're now measuring cloud scales across a large sample of nearby galaxies. And again, by using this, we start to get that continuum between typical galaxies and starbursts. All right? And so I've talked about this a little bit that, you know, even in nearby galaxies, we start to see this difference between the cloud properties in the disks and uh, the cloud policy properties in galaxy centers, especially things that are barred. Okay, so in this case, it's the gas mass surface density 
and the kinematics we measure for the GMCs. All right. And the thing is, we see the same as we start to look to the starbursts galaxies, M82, um, NGC 253, we start to resolve these. Okay, and so NGC 3256 all show these offsets in terms of clearly higher gas mass surface densities, but the clouds are much more kinematically disturbed as well. And so this is a nice paper um, comparing simulations from fire to what we observe with, you know, typical galaxies um, like Milky Way, um, Andromeda, and then the starburst galaxies, the antenna galaxies, um, NGC 3256. And looking at those cloud, cloud properties now, we're talking scales of 100 parsecs, um, we can see those difference. So typical star formation rate, typical galaxy falls exactly where we might expect Milky Way um, Andromeda sit. But as soon as we hit a merger, we end up um, in this regime. Okay, so star formation rates boosted, molecular gas is boosted, and the gas kinematics is much, much higher as well on a cloud to cloud scale. And we really are starting to see this. So that's one of the references there is when we compare fangs in the contours with the, so this is molecular clouds in fangs with molecular clouds in the starburst galaxies we see these things are much larger, more massive, and kinematically disturbed. And they're offset what we might expect from the Milky Way. All right? So that dashed line on the right is what uh, the Solomon and our uh, 87 sort of relation between cloud size, mass, uh, and um, dispersion. These things are up. Clearly, there's extra things going on there in terms of disturbing the clouds. Exactly what? This is a good question. Um, I've talked a lot about the molecular stuff. Clearly, lots of star formation, AGN, there is ionized ISM in your lurks. All right. Now, I've not talked much about the optical ionized lines like we've heard about H-alpha, oxygen 3, simply because we're talking obscuration we can't see a lot of these, or if we do see these, it's likely they're not directly associated with the bright infrared center. As we move to the near and um, to far infrared, then the lines are less likely to be obscured and they get us a clue of what's going on at the center of the Eulergs. And so what you see here is spits a spectra of some of the goal sample, and you see clear, nice PAH features that we've talked about, bright emission lines that can get us clues in terms of the ionization, star formation rates, other things. We also tend to see molecular lines um, that are likely either UV pumped or shock excited, and we can try and break this up. Um, so we can use these line ratios to diagnose what's going on. If we see neon five, clearly AGN, but if we don't see that, we can still use something like the other neon ratios to help us break down. Is there shocks like we see in the grids here or AGN will push us off in some direction. Uh, star formation will push us down in the other direction, depending on the ionization state of the lines um, and the relative strength. Finally, in the far infrared, we get to have a clue what's going on as well. And this pushes into that uh, both ionized and that uh, cool atomic regime, you know, such as with carbon two. So oxygen three, uh, nitrogen two ionized, carbon two, oxygen one measured. This Danny spoke about this in typical galaxies with Jessica's work, but now we're pushing off to the Eulerg regime and that um, deficit that we saw in typical galaxies is just enhanced lots in your lurks, okay? And so it goes what Danny was talking about. This is dust competing with photons and the variation between, you know, ionized and atomic gas are playing a huge role in what we're seeing here. So yeah, this is a nice work by Tanya in terms of bringing it together.
So let's move on to the AGN. AGN are interesting beasts. Okay, so hopefully most of you know, when I talk about AGN, I'm talking about accretion onto the supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies. All right. These things, you got huge amounts of accretion, at least for emission line AGN. This leads to strong winds, jets, hard UV, X-ray photons, um, all caused by an accretion disk. Likewise, you get very warm dust, things up to the sublimation temperatures. And so we can see this through a lot of mid-infrared emission. And so, you know, our stereotypical AGN, you know, we have the quasars at high redshift, some of the first sort of AGN um, there, and 1068, 4151, our stereotypical, uh, say for two and one objects. And we look towards the center of their galaxies, we see huge ionization cones, things that tell us what's going on. And, and this is the model sort of people have in our head. Now, this exact model might not be what's going on, but it's a generalistic idea for what's there. That is, we've got accretion onto a black hole and likely some larger scale clouds around the sides. Um, now, the reason we think this is because we can see differences between some AGN in terms of for some we can see broad lines, for some we can't. And we think most of this is just due to the viewing angle. And we can tell this because some objects show broad lines in scattered light. And what you can see here, I mean, the thing to take away is what the generalistic picture is of an AGN, but also the huge dichotomy, the huge um, spread of different types of names we have for AGN, depending on if they're radio loud or radio quiet, whether we're looking at them along the torus side, whether we're looking in, you know, into the torus, whether we're looking right down the, you know, the jets, um, are they bright, are they faint? All of these play a role in terms of this huge range. At the core, it's all about accretion onto a supermassive black hole, but the rate and viewing angle all play a role in what we're seeing. Likewise, why some have huge jets and why some don't is still an open question. Likely it's got to do with both the accretion and the magnetic fields and rotation of the supermassive black hole. Um, but yeah, again, people are still working on this for them. But the key points to think about is, does there huge amounts of radio? Is there not? Are there very strong mission lines likely associated with large accretion or are they not? And that's sort of the way we differentiate these. Now, one thing to note is because of this surrounding material associated, likely associated with the accretion disk, there is a preferential direction at which AGNs emit all their energy. Anything to the sides is likely absorbed by the dust, and that means all we see is the infrared emission associated with it. So while the infrared emission at long wavelengths is likely optical, is isotropic because the dust is optically thin, the very hot dust gets to be the optical thick part and everything else is going in these directions. Now these ionization cones will vary galaxy to galaxy depending on geometry, depending on accretion rate. And what we think is that for most typical AGN, so things from uh, SDSS, manga surveys, typical opening angles about 90 degrees. Yeah, so 90 degrees on both sides. Um, but this is likely to vary as a function of luminosity. So as you get more and more luminous, it's likely you're more able to blast things out further. But again, it can still be obscured. Talk about Eulergs. So there's a clear example where the AGN might be obscured. And you can even see this in 1068, it's a classic example where the, um, the ionizing cone is slightly tilted. So it hits the galaxy disc itself. And so this is Mu's view of 1068. I've taken out the emission lines and you can see spiral arms associated with H alpha. So, you know, it looks like a typical star forming gas galaxy. Right. But then in blue, I have the oxygen three, and this is tracing a lot more the ionization from the AGN. 
if I enhance the auction three, what you see is there are preferential directions where we see the auction three. So away from that, we don't see that blue emission. And that's where the cone is not getting to. Along this axis, you can see the auction three emission. But the other thing to note is that most of the, the red stuff doesn't look too different from one side to the other. And so while AGN will you know, clearly ionize gas, clearly heat, uh, provide some contribution to the H alpha, its contribution relatively is not as much as you'd expect. And so, um, you know, most of that, those spiral alarms look the same, whether I, I flick between this and this, you don't really see any difference. Okay. And so that sort of gets you the idea that, you know, AGN definitely affect their area within that cone, but star formation just seems to keep it going on as expected. Now, the, that geometry you have in your head of the AGN is key and clues for what the actual spectrum of an AGN will look like. Now, like I said, there is a dichotomy between radio loud, and radio quiet objects. Okay, there are radio loud have clear enhanced radio luminosities. We compare it to the stellar or infrared, we just see a huge offset. Uh, and that explains those ULURGs down here, right? These things are radio loud AGN. Their radio luminosity is much more in excess than what we might expect from star formation. And in fact, you know, uh, compared to other AGN, we see this offset as well. So anytime you see this, you know, radio front thread luminosity and see these objects well down, these are your radio AGN. And the infrared luminosity, like you can see, the underlying gray curve is what we might expect from the starburst. And the starburst seems to have a lot more infrared luminosity in the far infrared. And that's just because starbursts can heat dust and go on and heat large areas. And that's probably what's going on in ULURGs. But the AGN is definitely pushing towards the mere infrared. And that's because that torus gets much hotter than we expect from typical star forming regions up to the sublimation temperatures of dust. And so we're able to push that infrared bump into the um, mid infrared regime. And that's a key area that we look for. Likewise, they have an excess of ionizing UV radiation and push us off into the very high energy X-ray regime. And all of that is what we look for when it's uh, look diagnosing AGN and give clues into um, what's going on uh, with the ISM in AGNs. Now, one of the clearest indicators of an AGN is a broad recombination line. That is those clouds very close to the AGN, they're rapidly rotating around the black hole, so much so the line is broadened, rotationally broadened, well beyond what we might typically expect in galaxies. Um, why is it only seen in the recombination lines? It's because this gas is very high density. We're getting very close now to the accretion disk itself. Uh, and so we're seeing these things thermally broadened. And so much so, this gas is so close to the AGN that it actually varies on time scales we can observe, right? As the AGN accretion rate increases, you get more luminosity, you might see these clouds more, boom, these, you see broadline regions. As it declines, the broad lines might disappear. Likewise, it could be a case of maybe a cloud has come between us and that region. Okay, so we're really talking rapid variability for these objects. So for some, we can see variation on you know, years, for some months. And so that's what we look for AGN. We're really getting quite close to the center here of the black hole. All right, the classic example is the stars around Sag A star. Okay, but that's the kind of things we're talking about is where we can actually start to see orbits around the black holes. Now that hard radiation field makes a huge difference. And so we talked a little bit about this in terms of the BPT diagram where star forming galaxies follow a track which is defined mostly by the metallicity of the, of the galaxy. There are objects with um, weak low ionization 
extended over areas that have been called liners, liars, a whole range. This is associated with you know, very extended diffuse ionized gas. It can be associated with AGN, shocks, um, uh, leakage from H2 regions. There's a lot going on in that ready cloud. But then AGN will push you very to high ionization. Okay. And that is all due to that hard UV and X-rays creating high ionization, extended low ionization regions that give us that. And so as soon as we see things in that regime, we know there must be an AGN there, all right? As we go towards that clump in the middle, it gets harder because it's all about, it's likely a combination of sources, star formation, extended diffuse gas, uh, AGN. Right? And it's that hard UV X-ray radiation that's leading to those molecular differences. And so again, looking at ULURGs, we're starting to ex explore these with news and really try and probe what's going on around the ULURGs and maybe even trying to get towards the centers of these. Um, and you see that you know clear AGN liner um, star form regime. Yeah, the, the lines here are a mix of empirical and theoretical things. So we're, you know, we take codes like mappings and cloudies and try and explain what we do in those regimes. Um, but the dashed lines here are based purely on just Sloan galaxy spectrum, where we've tried to you know, match what we closely observe with galaxies. And so those differences get to the heart of there are things going on in these objects that we still don't understand, and we're still trying to define these. Um, we're pushing to the near infrared. We can start to diagnose shocks versus AGN versus star formation. Um, and now with JWS2, we can really explore a suite of these lines. Um, like I mentioned, mid infrared is a great way to select AGN, and people have been using this, especially with. WISE, um, IRS, everything that we can get. And it's all about getting mid-infrared emission from as compared to star formation. The only issue is as you absorb, you might start to confuse the two. And so ULURGs, especially the highest extinction ones, push us off in a you know, weird direction. Now, this is a, a JDOC spectra of a um, a ULURG, and you know, compared to that faint gray line that's the spectra spectra, you really get to see the suite of emission lines that are associated with an AGN. Right? As we go to the outskirts of the galaxy, we get PAH emission, that's those broad features along strong lines, but as we push towards the center of the galaxy, those PAH features disappear. Okay, clear indicator that there's an AGN there. Likewise, there's a very strong neon five line, clear indicator of an AGN, because nothing else can really ionize your gas up to those levels. And so by looking at that suite of lines, we really get to have a good handle of what's going on in this, in this galaxy. And Danny sort of spoke about this before, where you can use that pH feature and ionization uh, lines to determine what fraction of that ULURG is due to star formation and what fraction is due to AGN. And so that's what been try people have been trying to do for a while um, for the local ULURGs and really put them in terms of that and determine the amount of star formation rate uh, in these objects. Now, like I said, there are x-rays for these things. Now, the UV, as we talk about, has you know very high opacity. Hydrogen is very able to absorb ionizing UV photons. Likewise, dust absorbs lots of the UV photons. X-rays are able to travel much further distances. And so X-rays are a great way to see to the center of highly extinguished regions. Um, likewise, X-rays, you know, AGN are a good source of this. Um, but even you know, like Again, dust gets in the way and gas. Because there's so much gas 
in AG in some of the ULERGs, the X-rays themselves can start to be absorbed. And what we call about that about that is being Thomson thick. That is, we're seeing you know the interaction of X-rays with the gas. Um, what we can also do is look for key features that suggest very high ionization. So iron K alpha, you might have heard of this. It's a key in, you know, indicator that there's an AGN there. And it comes from when iron is being excited to, the, to its inner level. And so that's where you know this thing has huge amounts of radiation, right? So we talked about 84 electron volts. Um, this is 64, 6.4 kilo electron volts. Now, one thing you have to remember is that star formation rate can also create X-rays. That is, the X-ray binaries where you've got massive star accreting onto a, a black hole neutron star limit X-rays. Therefore, it's associated with star formation. And so there is a clear correlation between this. So these are known AGN in the goal sample, but these are things that, you know, believed not have AGN. And so you see this correlation between the infrared and the X-ray in these objects. And so that's one thing to always remember is that, you know, X-rays alone don't say AGN. It's having luminous X-rays or much more X-rays than you expect for the star formation rate. And then finally, radio. Like I said, these things, emit huge jets. These will affect the ISM both in the center parts through shocks, um, but are a way to eject cosmic rays um, and drive outflows to affect that, you know, CGM and the intergalactic medium area. And so radio jets are a huge influence on their environment, but their influence locally is still being debated. Uh, and so you might have heard about AGN feedback, about radio mode feedback, things like that. The idea is it's a way to provide heating from a central source to large gas for this. And so it's a key for pollution and a key to way, stop gas collapsing onto galaxies. Um, the pro exact processes, still exact, not known, but we have ideas there. And then finally, there's the extreme gamma rays and cosmic rays. Now, this is the Fermi bubble of the Milky Way, where you've got these gamma ray emission uh, and X-rays that have, you know fill a region above and below the Milky Way plane, likely due to some previous accretion event onto Sag A star. Uh, and these kind of things occur in other AGN quite often. So um, like Alexander talked about earlier, when we think about the most highest energy cosmic rays, AGN are the source for these. You've got huge amounts of ionization, strong magnetic fields. This is an easy way to get those cosmic rays. And then finally, this is something you know, I only learned recently is that in terms of neutrinos, 1068 is one of the uh, only extra nuclear source we know, right? So we've measured neutrinos from the sun we actually have measured neutrinos from NGC 1068. Uh, and so we're really pushing to the highest energy, re energy regime for these things. Um, in terms of measuring star formation in AGN, it's all about trying to subtract that AGN contribution, whether it be from the infrared to your HL for emission line to the UV. You try and do this spectrally spatially it's very hard when you get to quasars just because these things are so bright but even in local agn sometimes it's you know we have to play this game of what's that mixing what we do tend to find is, is for emission agn there is a these things tend to be more star forming than typical galaxies but when we compare them with say star bursts starburst galaxies with and without AGN, the star formation seems to be so slightly suppressed. So the AGN heating is having some impact on the star formation there. Um, but again, this is still an ongoing 
question for what's going on there. So <clears throat> um, the ISM and AGN hosts. So the um, if you've got strong emission lines from an AGN, it's likely due to strong accretion onto the central host. Um, therefore, unsurprisingly, you might expect star formation to be associated with strong emission line AGN. Now, AGN will heat the ISM. This is through cosmic rays, X-rays, UV photons, and jets. Likewise, they also have huge winds, which will impact the AGN. That, But that's only within that zone of influence, that is those ionization cones and you know, dragging along there. The rest of the disk is likely to be star forming like you might expect. So there are still open questions about how frequently this occurs, how long do AGN act for um, that we don't know. Okay, we have an idea that now that most galaxies do have a supermassive black hole. Uh, and so then the, pre the fraction of AGN gives us clues for this, but is it that fraction due to the length that an AGN acts for, or is it due to the frequency at which we see AGN occur? Still open questions. And the main problem is, you know, several of us have talked about, you know, issues of scale. AGN are really an issue of scale. We're getting down to, you know, those AU on, you know, cosmological scales. And so that's part of the problem of, um, you know, modeling AGN in a full complete basis in cosmological simulations. All right, so hopefully, you know, we've covered a huge range. I'll get to sort of the outflows um, part for this. Like I've talked about AGN, huge amount of energy in a small amount of space, you're going to create outflows. Starbursts are the same, huge amount of star formation, small amount of space, you're going to be driving a lot of energy and it'll try and escape leading to outflows. You've got uh, the processes Melanie talked about, stellar winds, radiation pressure, cosmic rays, all of those things, small amount of space will drive outflow. And it's for this reason, you know, when we talk about outflows, we typically show starburst galaxies because they're, they're obvious. Uh, we can trace those outflows to large scale heights. Um, and so we can really see the structure of outflows for these objects. So M82 is a classic example where we see, you know, ionized gas, we see extremely hot gas, we even see dust and atomic gas being all dragged out by that, you know, huge amount of star formation that's occurring at the center of the galaxy. And the thing is, you know, um, uh, we've talked about sort of that e-dig with that churn that goes on around that. And that's, you know, for galaxies like NGC 891, even our Milky Way, we have that. So clearly there are processes that cause that. But for starbursts, we're going to much larger scale heights. We're clearly dragging material out to the CGM and sometimes even to the IGM. And these outflows drive shocks. And so a lot of sort of the shock traces we see are associated with outflow galaxies. So galaxies with starbursts, driving shocks into the ISM, ionizing the gas, heating molecular gas. Um, and yeah, so we, when we look at shock models, supernova and outflow galaxies are a key, a key point to compare with. And something that we're still amazed about, but now we think occurs quite often is that these outflows can drag molecules and dust with them. All right? And that's something to think about because you've got this huge amount of energy, shocks and everything else. It's amazing you're still able to keep molecules and dust out to these large radii. So there's something about the process of entrainment that's able to keep this gas at least clumpy and not fully shocked and ionized out to these large radii. Yeah. And so again, classic starburst, NGC 253, we're able to trace the ionized gas and molecular gas out to large radii for this. 
And so it's because of these galaxies, so starbursts, um, and now I'm pushing down to the low, metallicity, low mass regime, are a key way to actually get our metals out to CGM and IGM. Right. AGN definitely can drive these things, but they're just not frequent enough. And so starbursts have to play a role in polluting the IGM. All right. And you know, I've been talking about, you know, sort of the CGM, but we clearly see outflows, not just uh, AGM, but outflows out to large, you know, 100 car kiloparsec radii in galaxies. Uh, this is in emission and absorption. And so these are not typical, but they're sufficient to really get those materials outside of the galaxy into the halos and beyond. Jets will also do this. Again, there's the question of entrainment, how much of the jet will bring along with it as it's driving through the galaxy. Um, simulations have been trying to capture that process of entrainment, especially when we look at turbulent ISM, you end up with drilling through the ISM and pushing most of just that jet out, but some material is able to be entrained with it. And that's, again, jets may be able to do some pollution of the IGM. And the key point is that, you know, radio jets, especially when you compare with um, you know, radio large area radio surveys have been observed to be extended to megaparsec scales. Right? When you look at radio continuum surveys in the extragalactic world, it's just amazing how large these things can go for. Uh, in terms of how much material is being brought out with these winds and jets, it's an open question. We're trying to trace this, get that material how much is going into it we use emission absorption multiple phase traces it's still an open question exactly what we're getting out there and how we can get this you know material not just into you know the local cgm but really into the galactic scales very open question trying to work out um so yeah, that sort of summarizes it. Stronger outflows seen in starburst galaxies, unsurprising. A lot of star formation in a small amount of area. Um, they'll remove gas locally. And so this gets to what Melanie was talking about, limiting further star formation, but it might not stop star formation completely in a galaxy. Like we heard about, there'll be the, from, so on, the, the material, a lot of it will flow back into the galaxies. And in fact, this is a key process for how we think the metallistic gradients in galaxies are created by adding material at the center and dispersing it to the outskirts. AGN can drive huge outflows and it might be the way we can impact the, the IGM. As a final point, people have asked about this. We talk about the star formation in kinematically disturbed areas. So again, starting from Eulergs, these are huge interacting galaxies. Right. And at the centers, we're driving material in, causing huge amounts of star formation. But these huge interactions are also driving large tidal tails out kiloparsecs from the galaxy. This material is likely enriched. And what we tend to see in some of these objects is star formation starting to occur in these tidal tails. And so this is you know, one process which we can start to get new dwarf galaxies out of these interactions. And so these things are interesting because they're kinematically disturbed. They're clearly associated with long tidal tails, but we're starting to see star formation in these objects. And it's not material that's been, sorry, it's not star formation that's being dragged from the galaxies, but rather it's star formation in situ in gas that's being dragged from these galaxies. All right. <clears throat> So these are very interesting areas to look at the star formation process because you've got interesting kinematics, mostly H1. Is the material enriched is still an open question. Further, because they've been tidally stripped, they don't have dark matter. They're not like the dwarfs we see in the millennium simulation and everything. These are galaxies forming in situ 
with no dark matter. Like I've been saying, they might be enriched because they're associated with the galaxy material that's being stripped from a galaxy um, and have been observed in carbon monoxide. So again, that star formation process, comparing with Kinnegut Schmidt, see where they lie, how do they, how does having no dark matter affect the star formation rate process? Jellyfish galaxy is another beautiful, interesting object. These are galaxies that have been falling into clusters and all the material around clusters is dragging and ram pressuring, uh, ram pressure stripping that material out. As you can imagine, shocks are playing a huge role here in terms of impacting the ISM and dragging out. Yet again, thanks to surveys like GASP, we're able to see star formation in situ in that stripped gas. So somehow in that process of being shocked and stripped from that galaxy, we're getting to that material, um, to densities where star formation can be um, occur. And we really can see that it's not shocks occurring. It is really star formation in situ. That is the emission lines look like star formation. We can see the UV sources associated with them. And finally, we've taught, heard a lot of talk about central molecular zones. This is another area where kinematics are playing a huge role in that star formation rate process. And so we've measured the amount of gas there, we've measured the amount of star formation rate there, and yet we don't see as much star formation as we might expect from the amount of material there. So what's going on there? Kinematics are playing a huge role here. When we look at you know, PPV space, the central molecular zone is quite dynamic. Unsurprising, you've got material there. Dynamics, shear is probably playing a role. The Henshaw review is a very nice overview of all we know of our Milky Way central molecular zone. But what's interesting is when we compare the central molecular zone with other galaxy central molecular zones, it does still appear to be offset, but we also can see regions that just look like it too. All right, so yes, the CMZ does seem to be offset as compared to other galaxy central molecular zones, but they all show a depression, um, just not to the same extent. And when we look again, thanks to resolved imaging of nearby galaxies, in this case, uh, Miguel's work in M51, we can see that same depression occurring when we get to kinematically disturbed regions. So the kinematics and gas are basically affecting that. So rapid overview of all of these things. There are clear biases. I'm not talked about low metallicity, not talked about magnetic fields, very rarely touched on cosmic rays, clusters, all of these things I've missed out on. So know there's more out there and I'll leave you with these reviews. Time for some questions. Who is ready? Um, so I have again a question related to the circonuclear ring, um, maybe in relation to the outflows that you mentioned in the end. So is, is it possible that, um, okay, so as a premise, I'm working on starburst in cosmological simulations. And what we see is that the starburst is the responsible of this, the formation of these rings, uh, of these dense gas rings that are still star forming. And so I'm wondering whether we have evidence for the circonuclear ring to be a product of a previous starburst that is slowly dying out. I'm trying to think if we do have evidence for that. I mean, we have tried to look at the star formation history, at least in nearby galaxies. But the main problem is, you know, when you've got all this, both dust and luminous star formation, 
it's very hard to get a correct star formation history just because those young stars outshine everything. Mm. And so what we tend to find is whenever there's huge amounts of star formation, huge amounts of dust, we end up getting star formation histories, at least in the you know first few million years, they're probably wrong. Right? Even to the point where you know there might be larger uncertainties on the stellar masses in those areas. So I can't think of the top of my head any um, clear evidence that's associated with an earlier event. Mm. I do know that within these rings, we can sort of see a recent tracer. And so I can't remember who spoke about the pearls on the string versus idea of star formation occurring in situ or processing along the ring. Um, so there's sort of evidence there, but evidence for an earlier event of mm. star formation is, you know, in the history. Uh, to cause these, I don't know. All right, thanks. Uh, thank you for this great talk. Uh, I just wonder about uh, what kind of feedback do you expect for the region and uh, how do you quantify that? So when we talk about feedback in terms of locally, so definitely AGN must be removing material from the central area of galaxies. Um, we can see that both in terms of the winds and jets, um, but it's the question of timescales. We also know that star formation is actively occurring around AGN. Uh, and we see this in terms of, you know, Sagittarius A star. Okay, here's a galaxy, here's our Milky Way. The AGN is not rapidly active, but we can see these S stars going right around the black hole there. So stars are definitely formed in the vicinity of a black hole. Um, likewise, we've got examples of 1068 where we've got the star bursting ring and 1068 is a well-known AGN, 1365, same idea. So it can't stop stars instantaneously, but is it likely to impact star formation on a longer time scale? The cosmological simulations suggest yes, uh, just because especially when you've got something luminous, it's removing a lot of large amount of material from that and heating the ISM that might end up falling onto the galaxy itself as well. Some other questions? Oh, another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so if the if a galaxy is both starburst but also has an agent and the starburst happens close to the agent, can we associate them together or the... It's hard. It's hard because it's a factor of scales. Like I said, you know, for the AGN, we're really talking central part of the galaxy at very, very small scales. Somehow gas is getting from the larger scales onto that accretion disk. And that's still a difficult process. People do think bars might be associated, but then people who looked at this and also said that, you know, bars aren't the key driver. So how you get gas from the outskirts to the inskirts is still an open question. Um, hey, Brian, thanks for the nice talk. So I was just wondering, earlier you mentioned about how um, the HCN and CO fraction tells us about the dense gas fraction. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, while well, we do know that, well, CO, the reason why CO is good because it's highly abundant and then it has a dipole moment and stuff like that yeah so i was just wondering so my question is if you know um what are the properties of hcn or even like you mentioned hco plus which allows us to trace dense gas specifically sorry what what's your question so if what is the what are the properties of hcn and hco and why, why do we use them as dense but, gas tracers? i guess so one they're not as abundant that's one of the reasons why we don't use them everywhere. Two, this is not my area, so I'm ah, okay. to draw. Um, we definitely know their properties in terms of their having higher critical densities. Um, okay. And so hence, that's why we know they're able to trace denser gas. Um, but for, you know, my understanding in terms of why we don't use it all the time, it's because of luminosity. And you could sort of see that in the spectra I showed, you know, carbon monoxide, huge. Right, it's made up of two of the most abundant uh, atoms, uh, carbon, oxygen. Therefore, is bright. Uh, the other molecules must do something in terms of lower abundances, uh, excitations, things like this. I'd have to look and see 
myself. And maybe a few people here might be able to answer better than I do. Thanks. Um, is the orientation of the jet of the AGN um, somehow connected to if there's a star forming region around it or not? Not that I'm aware of in terms of that we have um, clear associated star formation with galaxies with no jets and clear star formation, uh, sorry, you know, and some jets with no known star formation. So the jets themselves are unlikely to be directly associated with the star formation. Having said that, something needs to drive material to the center of the galaxies. And it's quite possible that what's causing the jet has to do with the properties of the black hole itself, which might have to do with the history of the galaxy itself. So there's probably some connection between the star formation history and jets, but the exact mechanism still not known because you know, it's likely got to do with accretion, magnetic fields, and these processes are still hard to model. Got some other questions in the audience? Thank you for the lecture. Um, I, I, I just wanted to kind of, uh, I guess, uh, clarify the, some of the things that I saw. And I remember there's one plot that shows with a larger CO velocity dispersion, we have a higher fraction uh, of HCN, well, higher HCN over CO ratio. Yep. So that's saying that in a more turbulent environment, we form dense gas more easily. Or, mm, well, no, I mean, so firstly, you know, this is something that's observed, right? Um, so the, it's likely to do with something, a property of the um, gas itself. So one thing we do know is that as you get more massive and denser, your, um, the dispersion in the molecular clouds must be larger, okay? Because this is that Larson's law, you know, if you get bigger, it's to be uh, kinematically supported, you must see this relation. And that's what we serve in the Milky Way, things like that. Why exactly that the clouds appear to be offset in starburst regimes, I don't know. Um, and so that goes to that plot of why we might exactly see this. It must be something to do with the way the clouds are being heated in these more you know, kinematically interesting, denser environments. But why, I don't know. Thank you. So, so the HCN there is, are you saying that it's not necessarily tracing the dense gas? The no, HCN no, I, I'm definitely saying that then, you know, HCN is definitely tracing dense gas. And so the dense gas fraction must increase for this. Um, it's likely got to do with both the clouds being bigger and the clouds being, you know, overall denser. But why that is, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Any any other questions up here? Ah, the other side. Hello, thanks for, for the nice talk. I actually have a question about the first half of the of the lecture. So you showed the you showed us the, the plot showing the star formation rate versus the, the gas mass. Uh, and I have a question about uh, the, uh, the the fact that you mentioned that H1 rich gas, uh, H1 rich galaxies have a low star formation efficiency. Uh, I maybe you mentioned it already, but did that plot include uh, galaxies at several redshifts, or did that? No, so the the, um, the, the big eel plot mm -hmm. is all sort of local galaxies. Okay, so the the one I showed from Emmanuel Daddy did include high redshift galaxies, but that was up at the starburst high right. gas mass regime. Yeah, so, be because my question was indeed like, does this does this lope evolve with redshift? Like, does the the star formation efficiency change with the redshift? 
especially for H1 dominated galaxies? Well, that's a good question in terms of H1 dominated galaxies, because the problem is, you know, observing H1 in a mission, we can really only go to, you know, point two, three. There, you know, there are the statistical H1 absorption studies, but so knowing what we do know and um, that as we go back in time, the, the at least to redshift two galaxies become much more gas rich and molecular gas rich. So I can't really speak to the H1 dominated galaxies because these are likely the lower mass galaxies that we just haven't observed in quantities there. Likewise, we, you know, observing H1 at these redshifts would be amazing, but no, uh, FAST is trying to push. So the, the, the Chinese 500 meter aperture telescope is trying to push back further and further. But yeah, I can't speak to exactly what's happening in these galaxies. I would be surprised if it's hugely different from what we see locally, because it's all about what fraction of that H1 is really getting involved in the star formation rate process. Okay, and maybe Karen will talk about something about that now in her talk, I don't know, um, because it's got all to do with both metallicity and the fact that H1 is seen on much larger scales especially things like X coal gas, et cetera, you know, H1 can extend much further than the molecular gas. And so it's likely not all of that is playing a role in star formation. All right. Well, let's thank Brent again. <laughs>